Okay, excellent. Uh, welcome. My name is Dana Garvis. I run Oregon Brew Lab, and once a month I do a talk on something that interests me uh, called the Fireside Chats. I have a propane torch behind me going with a steady flame uh, to, to hang on to that fireside feel. Um, tonight we're going to be talking about beer color. It is totally a super real measurement. I know that sounds sarcastic and it kind of is, but only because um, it's actually called standard reference method that is one of the main drivers for measuring beer color in the industry. Uh, and um, I only say that sarcastically because there are huge margins of error within the measurement itself. So um, it's a sort of amorphic thing that I wanna dive into. Uh, let's So today uh, I'm gonna quickly go over why I'm interested in beer color and why we're gonna talk about it tonight. We'll talk a little bit about the science of how we use light and energy to measure color. Um, and then we're gonna look at how we measure color within the beer industry with three separate ways. Uh, and then we're gonna go into my favorite part of the talk, which is just some considerations to sort of um, take these measurements with a, with a grain of malt, if you will. Uh, because there's, there's some uh, errors to explore. And then lastly, if there's any questions about beer color, um, you are more than welcome to ask away. So inspiration, why beer color and is it important? And it is, it's used every day for measuring the color of beer that follow Reheinz Kubat uh, style beers. So something that's very simple with malts, water, hops, and then if you wanna get crazy, adding some yeast. Uh, it is really useful for sort of your base style beers. Um, it is the easiest and literally the most affordable quality control test for brewers. You can print off uh, a chart and be able to, to check your, your beer colors uh, for the cost of whatever that, that printer and that page and that ink was. Um, it is a really cool chemistry because it's based in the chemistry of light and energy, which means lasers. So we're measuring beer with lasers, which I think is pretty cool. Uh, and, and for an, another reason, like I said earlier, huge margin of error in beer color is something that I find pretty fascinating because it is something that we use in beer judging. And it's something that we use to um, sort of eat with our eyes before we've even had our first sip. So with this huge margin of error, how useful is this calculation or this measurement? So let's get into the science of it. How do we use light and energy to measure color? Well, for the measure of color, we use colorimetry, you know, color meaning rainbow, metry meaning meter to measure uh, colors. And it, what it does is it measures the human perception of color. So we have here the sun emitting its glorious light um, onto this red apple. It absorbs all the colors of the light coming out from the sun, but it reflects and transmits that red color to our eyes, which we perceive as red. Uh, not so much if you're colorblind, um, but there's actually a way that we turned in this method into a quantifiable uh, piece of equipment. So this is a spectrometer. This is the one I use. It's directly behind me right here. Uh, and it's, um, it means a piece of instrument or a piece of equipment that measures light from an image. And so that's sort of a little bit what we do with colorimetry with just our eyes and looking and comparing and seeing things. Um, we distilled that down into a piece of equipment. So how do we measure light with our eyeballs? Well, we get a source, right? We get light to be shown. We can't really see color very well in the dark. And our visual range is in the 400 nanometer to 700 nanometer range uh, within the light spectrum. Once uh, that light comes in, it hits something, say that red apple, uh, and with some light it absorbs and with other light it transmits. So it's shooting that red light into our eyes uh, in which it hits our lens. And this acts as a bit of a magnifying glass for um, our rods, which act as a, a sort of filter. 
that filter out that light and separate it into its different categories. We perceive it as red, but maybe it also has tones of yellow, tones of pink or orange, and those are gonna get separated out by our cones. And then our brain is gonna act as sort of a detector and a decodifier to tell us what that color is. Oh, that apple, that apple's red. Uh, and so this process is actually found in spectrometers as well. So this is sort of um, an inner workings of what a spectrometer does. And just like with our eyeballs, there's a source of light. Uh, however, with a spectrometer, we're able to go down further beyond our range of vision into the um, ultraviolet or the UV range. So spectrometers can actually go as, down as far as 160 nanometers. And it's gonna shoot a little light through a diffraction grating, uh, which splits the light source a lot like if you stare at a light source through the back of a CD, if you look at that reflection, or if you think of the classic uh, Pink Floyd album cover uh, with the prism splitting the light. Once we split that light within the spectrometer, we can actually select which wavelengths we wanna put through forth in our sample. So we select the wavelengths that we wanna test at and in beer that's 430 nanometers. So we shoot that through. And uh, sometimes the light is gonna get absorbed based on how dark that malt character is, or it'll go straight through uh, because that Pilsen malt doesn't carry a ton of color. Uh, and then we're going to get to the end, which is the detector that um, detects those light changes from what went in to what came out. And just like our brain, it's able to process and through uh, software is able to give us a number for how much uh, of that wavelength was absorbed by the beer. Okay, that was a lot of pretty in-depth science, but let's get to how we actually use our eyeballs and photospectrometers to measure color. So we have the instrumentation, how do we do it? So it's measured in three different ways. And the first one is with our eyeballs. Uh, we always wanna remove uh, all particulate through filtering or through centrifuge. We wanna confirm there's no turbidity. Then we're gonna use a clean, dry pint glass. If there's any liquid in there at all, any water, it will dilute the color and change it. Uh, so you want to make sure it's dry completely. And you want to fill the bottom two to three inches of the pint glass with your beer sample uh, that has been filtered and centrifuged. And then we're going to use an SRM chart, which is standard reference method, uh, to assign the closest number to the color. And those look like this. And you've seen these all over the place, right? So we're going to take our pint glass of two to three inches of beer that's as clear as we can get it, and we're going to put it against this, this chart. These charts are all over the place, right? Every time you Google uh, SRM chart or beer color, you get a million of these. And, and um, I'm not too proud to admit that I also have one <laughs> which you can purchase for $2. Uh, I think they're incredibly useful uh, to just have in, in your wallet and pull out whenever someone wants to check their beer colors. So then not just with our eyeballs, but we can test SRM with the uh, spectrophotometer. So we're still going to be removing all of that particulate, all of that haze down to nothing. And we actually have a secondary measurement within the SRM process uh, that confirms there's no turbidity in the sample. So we're going to use a 10 millimeter or one centimeter glass cuvette. Um, we're going to rinse it and blank with DI water run it through the spectrometer to blanket. Then we're gonna do two to three pre-rinses of the sample. And then we're gonna measure the sample. We're gonna run it at 430 nanometers and 700. 430 is where beard does its most absorbing. And 700 again is that uh, secondary turbidity uh, measurement. So once you know that your sample is clear enough, this uh, SRM calculation is actually really quite easy. We multiply by this cofactor, 12.7, uh, times the absorbance that you had at 430 nanometers times your dilution factor. So for most beers, you're able to just pour right into the cuvette. Sometimes if a beer is too dark, you'll need to uh, dilute it down and that dilution factor is, is what this DF stands for. So SRM is a very straightforward uh, measurement and is super simple if you have a uh, spectrometer. 
Now you can also test with your spectrometer uh, tri-stimulus. And here we are again, step one, filter and centrifuge, remove all those particulates. Uh, this time, instead of a glass cuvette or yeah, glass cuvette, we're going to use a quartz cuvette. Uh, this just is because we're getting down into lower wavelengths, which can actually uh, get diffracted by glass. So we want to use quartz, which is a little easier for light to get through. Again, you want to rinse DI with a sample. You want to blank on water and then you're going to run. Uh, the range. Now you're going to run this spec from full range from 380 nanometers to 780 nanometers at every five nanometer interval for half a second. Uh, and that sounds really complicated. Uh, well, because it is. So these are the calculations we're going to do with all of those five increments from 360 to 780 uh, that we're going to plug this in to determine our tristimulus value, which is known as C-Lab or L-A-B. Okay, those calculations are not easy, but don't worry. The American Society of Brewing Chemists has your back. You can just add the data, whether you have a newer spectrometer that talks well with others and can produce an Excel sheet for you, you can just copy and paste or enter directly the data into these pre-made uh, Excel sheets that do all the calculations for you. So you don't have to worry about those absurd sums uh, and those crazy equations on the previous slide. Now what's cool about C-Lab, which is the value you get from tri-stimulus, is that these values can actually be converted to hex code and RGB, which is um, hex is the hashtag followed by a series of numbers and digits that uh, assign a certain color on the web. Uh, same with RGB, which is a red, green, and blue uh, hues. So I really like, you can just do this conversion pretty much anywhere on the internet. There's tons of different uh, calculators, but I really like colorizer.org. I think they do a really great job. Um, and a lot of information for my presentation today comes from, comes from their website. So C-Lab uh, is basically looking at color in a 3D uh, space where L is your lightness. So how light or dark is that? Um, and then A is a scale between red and green and B is a scale for blue and yellow. And so what that looks like are these two plots here. So this first one on the left, we're looking down at our A scale and our B scale. So up, to down here from north to south, we're going from yellow to blue. That's our B scale. And then on the x-axis here from A negative to A, we have the green color to sort of the red color. And then if we look now, instead of directly down, but from the side, uh, we have really bright colors up top and the really dark colors, low light colors below. And so that's what C-Lab looks like plotted. And that's, this is um, why it's a much more intricate uh, calculation for what beer color is. Oh, that was a lot, huh? <laughs> that was a lot of equations. Um, I, I think that beer color, measuring beer color is something that's super fascinating, but there are a ton of errors and I wanna show some of them to you. So here's one example, path length. So we like pint glasses, I like pint glasses, but what we really like pint glasses for is on the bottom directly across is five centimeters every pint glass, unless you have a shitty pint glass. Uh, so here we have two different beers. This is a porter and this is a CDA. Uh, and in the same pint glass under the same shitty fluorescent lighting, uh, they look the same. However, if you put these beers in a cuvette, they actually look significantly different, right? So that's because a cuvette's path length is one centimeter, so a fifth of the amount of beer that the light has to get through. This porter still looks pretty porterish, whereas this CDA actually is starting to look like an amber. Uh, I think that this is a really good example of why SRM charts are not really good um, because a lot of them require you to use a pint glass uh, 
to to measure against a chart but what you're actually comparing against when there's a uh, equipment measurement is this and so um, your SRMs are going to be off from what you predict versus what uh, the measurement actually is. So we are going to do some zoom polls uh, to just do some beer color estimation right now. So um, how this works is this is the color of the beer that we're going to be measuring this cuvette here. Uh, and I have the scale of one to 10, it's somewhere in here, where I will put the zoom poll up. And if you would be so kind as to answer it, let's launch the polls. I think, oh, you want, okay. Zoom wants me to put them all up. So go ahead, take your time and put in an estimate for um the beer colors for each beer there's four of them and four questions see I don't see anyone else in the waiting room thank you both or all three of you for being here um we are going to end the polling uh good job so um what we actually measured uh for beer number one was SRM degrees two for uh beer number two it was 14 for beer number three it was 24, oh, excuse me, 26, sorry. Um, and then for number four, it was 40. So you can see how hard this is, right? Let's, I won't share the results. Okay. Thank you for taking the poll. So some other considerations. The haze craze has absolutely changed the way that we look at beer, literally figuratively, we consider beer appearance something completely different than we did when I first entered this industry. Um, removing haze to make the measurement changes the essence of the beer. So what does that mean? Fruit additions, same idea, filtering out fruit, filtering out chunks or filtering out puree really changes the appearance of the beer. Uh, and when we're adding all these crazy additions to beer, we're really only bound to SRM by malt colors from yellow to black, uh, where we span some yellows, reds, and oranges in there, some browns. Uh, we don't really include the full rainbow. Uh, and so that's something we maybe need to look into. And then um, screens it, and how we, we receive information is so varied and there's so many filters between me, which has a camera that goes through my laptop, which then is showing on Zoom, which then is going through your computer and maybe you also have blue light filtering glasses on. What you see may not be what I see even on this very slide. So screen settings are, are another reason why color is so complicated. Let's look at a few of my critiques here. Haze craze, this is all the same beer. Um, this first glass uh, container here has it just poured straight from the can. There's even a little bit of a head there still. Uh, and you cannot see the text behind. Uh, this second container has been filtered through a paper filter. Uh, a little thicker than like a bamboo coffee filter. Um, and you can start to see a little bit of text through it. 
And then this beer, which actually did pass the SRM turbidity test, uh, which is the same beer, just centrifuged for about 15 minutes. And now you can see all the way through it. Um, these beers don't look the same to me. So it's, I think it's interesting that we test the beer in a fashion that is not true to um, how it ends up looking. And considering that beer color is an essential component of the overall sensory perception of the product, uh, it seems ridiculous that our standards still require us to um, to do this. It makes sense scientifically, but uh, what does it mean uh, philosophically? So fruit additions, uh, this is a raspberry, uh, white raspberry and black raspberry uh, fruited sour um, that has actual raspberry seeds in it. Um, with the rise of heavily fruited beers, some standards are starting to expect chunks uh, in their beer. And so these are things that we need to take in consideration. Um, I want to just show you this beer I poured that um, has some extreme chunkiness. I'm going to play it all the way through and then I'm going to try and find a moment where there are chunks. And every time you see a massive splash, that was a chunk of strawberry um, <laughs> coming out of the beer. That was pretty intense, right? Um, okay, somewhere around here you can actually see yeah this huge chunk of strawberry wow, that was a nice catch um splash up out of out of the beer so um these beers are becoming more widespread uh so this is that same beer poured directly uh right into this little container this is the same beer that had to be centrifuged for about two hours uh just to get it see through um, I still don't think it, it will pass the um, SRM turbidity test because there is still a little bit of haze in there, but um, it is a lot better. Here you can see the light of this light box is able to pass through the beer sample, whereas on this cuvette, um, the light is literally reflected, mirrored back because that beer is so cloudy. Um, we would test this one for the color sample, but this is more true to the actual color. Do you think they're the same? I don't. Uh, screen settings, again, um, just talking about the, you know, different times of day that you could look at beer, different lightings. Uh, you know, I, I love the fact that my glasses and my phone allow for me to block uh, blue light from screens. Um, but that does change things when you, when you look at them in terms of color. Um, think about just how, um, you know, when a printer gets old, it has faded ink. Uh, it's still trying to produce blue, but is it really blue anymore? Um, when we go through so many filters to look at things, uh, what is true color? It's a good question. Um, with the rise of fruited uh, sours, again, we're seeing different colors put into beer. I mean, we've always sort of seen green beer around March, but um, that was a dye and not a necessarily <laughs> Uh, something that was meant for longevity. So we're adding colors like blue, green, and purple to the beer spectrum, and we're pretty limited by our palettes. So now I want to talk about my considerations, but I want to show you just a little bit of data that I've been collecting uh, for the last seven years. Um, I have been doing OMSI after dark events pre-COVID where I would go and have drunken people rate beer color of different beers. Um, I also have been avid, um, at adding uh, Instagram stories where people can weigh in and measure beer color. And tonight we did a Zoom poll. So um, I wanted to kind of show you that in terms of why um, uh, charting isn't that accurate. But then I also want to go and show you this um, sort of experiment that I did uh, with a with a brewer on 14 different smash beers um, where we had uh, single malts responsible for the color of, of these beers. And we looked at a comparison of SRM and Tristim. So um, this was my very first OMSI after dark sampling. Um, we, I took four beers uh, to OMSI and had um, a drunken crowd come through and measure uh, 
beer color based on an SRM chart like the ones that I showed you before. Um, and so the yellow dots in the center of the data is the actual value. Um, we've got the measured data on the side here, and then we've got the estimated data here. Um, and so this was just one event with uh, about 100 participants. And you can see that the lower the data, or sorry, the lower the color, the lighter the color, the closer and tighter the data is. As it gets darker, uh, our humans, we start to um, vary what, what, we, what we think color looks like. So then this is um, after four years of events. Um, this is a ton of data, even though it doesn't look like very much because it's all very much stacked. So um, each one of these red dots is a point, uh, is a beer that was tested at an OMSI event. Um, and then these tails here are all of the color um, that people estimated for it. So again, you're seeing in the lower range, less variance in the higher range, tons of variance. Um, so that was OMSI. Um, that's about four to 500 uh, people worth of data for four beers each round. Uh, it was a very intense data collection, but um, I think it, it really shows sort of um, how much we're in agreement with lighter colors, but not so much with darker colors. Uh, this is from Instagram stories, where I offer a little slide and I say, you know, uh, pick the color that you think this beer is, uh, similar to the cuvettes that we just looked at. And um, Instagram's actually pretty good at it. Uh, I'm really impressed. So um, the closer to the line the dot is, the more accurate um, the Instagram was. If it's above the line, Instagram was estimating higher color. Uh, if it's below the line, Instagram was uh, estimating lower color. Um, you know, I and each dot is a different beer. So um, I think that this is pretty impressive. Definitely some of the best data um, or the most correlative data. I think that there's also lots of room for error in using Instagram as, as a way to collect data. Um, and then there's Zoom polls. So I just did our little Zoom poll. Um, and I'm definitely going to be hanging on to that data and adding it into my giant amalgam. All right, so let's talk about this uh, data that I have collected with this brewer, excuse me. Um, so uh, 14 different uh, smash beers here, um, all different colors of malt. You could probably guess some of the malts based on here. And we tested this beer color in a lot of different ways. So we had multiple people look at this beer in person with an in-person SRM card. We then had the same people look at that same SRM card, but on a screen and compare the beer in person. Um, we then use the SRM method without dilutions to uh, measure the beer. And then we did tri-stimulus measurement here. We're already seeing a lot of difference, right? This is SRM card, this is spectrophotometer. So why, why not make things a little more complicated? And I took a picture of the beer. So um, after I took a picture of the beer, I used targeted colors to select the color that seemed the most representative of the beer color in the photo. And this is the um, red, green, blue uh, choice that that beer created. Um, and then used the same people to look at the picture of the beer and rate it against the SRM chart. So these are six different ways that we can test SRM. And we have six different colors for all of these different malts. Um, it's pretty fascinating to me, number 11 in particular, which has some red tones that doesn't come through um, with the SRM chart, but does come through with the photo um, and the SRM measurement. Um, I think this number two here with the super red in the photo and fairly red, but more of a brown in all of the SRM charts. Um, and then of course, this darkest malt here 
um, that just is some variation of, of black. So what I did is I went through and got the uh, RGB for each one of these six types of measurements and created an average, which is this. This is the average of all those colors. That is the true beer, or <laughs> beer SRM uh, for that malt. Um, looking at the same malt, each uh, point here is one malt. So this was the lightest malt over here. This was that really dark black malt. Um, and then each one of these lines represents a different SRM measurement or um, color measurement. So uh, this green line is our estimations on the SRM card. This next line is the SRM measurements without any dilutions. You can see when it gets dark enough, right about uh, 20 SRM, it sort of plateaus. That's where the ASBC recommends that you do a dilution of either dilution factor of one to five or dilution factor of one to 10, depending on how dark the beer is. So the orange line, the bottom one here, that is a dilution of uh, one to five. And then this red line, which goes well above 100 SRM uh, is a dilution factor of uh, 10. So I generally stick to a dilution factor of five because I think it's gonna be um, somewhat accurate. Um, which one of these is right? I don't, I don't know. I couldn't tell you. Um, they're really only accurate down here where us humans can agree on color. So some final considerations about all that information. Um, beer color is still a great thing to do if you are consistent with how you measure it. If you use the same spectrometer every day, uh, you can go back, look at your baseline and have an expectation for what your SRM should be. But if you just pull a random SRM chart off the internet every time, it's a different one, it's a different screen, it's your work phone, it's your personal phone, uh, you have one printed and taped that's been in the sun for four years, um, that is not a very consistent method. But if you have um, perhaps a waterproof or beer proof wallet, uh, SRM card that can't fade um, and you use that every time, it can be a very useful quality control tool. Um, beer color is still a work in progress. This is something that's being discussed um, by people who do beer science because with the explosion of new beer styles, we kind of need a way to discuss these other adjuncts that are now being more widely added to beer. Um, science needs to move forward with consumers on that. Um, and then finally, I would just like to say as a beer judge myself, um, I think beer judging could stand to be a little more lenient with color range. As we saw, um, the measurements themselves can't be trusted. So perhaps we should, we should be a little more courteous to, to people um, because maybe we're not looking at that beer in the right light. All right, um, I am going to take questions now, if there are any questions um, for beer color. No pressure. Okay, well, thank you all so much for coming. Um, my next Fireside Chat is going to be July 15th. Um, same day, which is Thursday at 6 p.m. Uh, the topic is going to be determined. I haven't really, haven't really solidified that yet. Um, and I would like to say thank you to SlidesGo, which uh, provided these really awesome slides uh, that I have never seen before. So um, I think that they were really cool and uh, that's an awesome resource. So thank you for coming. I'm gonna go ahead and stop my recording. Um, cheers.